Alrighty, hello. So this is um, uh, the next in our series of videos uh, that attempt to review and supplement the content of Module 1 or Chapter 1 in your textbook, which provides an introduction to cognitive psychology. Um, so in, in this particular video, um, I'm going to continue talking about the decline of behaviorism and its importance in the development of cognitive psychology. Um, and we're going to talk about, uh, in particular, something called instinctual drift and why that was a problem for strict behaviorist accounts. Alrighty. So one of uh, B.F. Skinner, and again, Skinner was a very prominent behaviorist, um, one, of his, one of his main arguments um, was that there was no such thing as instincts, right? So, so the really the strongest behaviorist accounts would argue that all behavior is learned or all behavior is a product of one's environment and a product of or the result of simple associations, right? So everything we learn as a consequence of our environment and as a consequence of simple associations that have been forged either between stimuli, as is the case with classical conditioning, or between a particular behavioral response and an outcome. Right. So, so basically what uh, B.F. Skinner said, um, which was kind of a rehashing of the old um, sort of Lockean argument, right, that we come into the world a blank slate, right? So we, we aren't endowed with any sort of ability or knowledge, right? So again, he would say there's no such thing as instincts, all behavior is learned. Um, and so he, see, so he asserted this argument against instincts um, in, a, in a very famous book that he wrote called The Behavior of Organisms. Um, and so uh, two of his graduate students uh, actually got married. So uh, Keller and Marion Brayland um, worked under Skinner when they got their uh, PhDs in psychology, um, and they went on to apply what they learned, um, particularly this technique of operant conditioning, um, to working with animals. So Keller and Marion Brayland uh, were quite famous, and they uh, were responsible for the first animal and bird shows, right? So the first commercial animal and bird shows. So they worked for SeaWorld, they worked for Walt Disney, um, and they also trained livestock uh, to sell farming equipment um, for General Mills. So they did a series of advertising um, spots with animals doing various things um, as part of an advertising campaign for General Mills, right? So they were very, very adept at teaching animals to do all sorts of things, right? So you see here that they have taught a guinea pig to play the piano and so on. Um, so they were very successful and they worked with all sorts of animals. Um, but one of the things that they noticed was um, what has now become referred to as instinctual drift. So instinctual drift is the tendency for an animal to revert back to instinctive behaviors in such a way that they interfere with a conditioned response, right? Um, so what Keller Brayland and Marion Brayland found um, when they tried to teach a raccoon to put little wooden tokens into a piggy bank is that a lot of times instead of putting the tokens into a piggy bank, the raccoon would drift to his instinctive behavior, which was to put the tokens on the ground and sort of turn them over in his paws, um, which is a behavior that a lot of raccoons do when they have found a food source, right? 
Um, so what they found over the years as they worked with animals is that they couldn't condition them or the conditioned responses that they learned uh, were often uh, replaced or, or the stronger behavioral response was an instinctive response. So no matter how many time, how many trials they did where they where they taught this raccoon that he would be rewarded for putting uh, these these pegs into a piggy bank, um, he always reverted back to his desire to kind of roll them around on the ground like he typically would for a food source, right? So why does that matter? Well, it goes against this argument, right? So they actually uh, made their or wrote their own uh, text called uh, The Misbehavior of Organisms, where they talked about uh, this tendency for instinctual drift. So again, why is that important? Well, it suggests that not all behavior can be learned or not all behavior is, our, is the product of our environment or simple associations. We also come into the world uh, exhibiting certain behaviors called instincts and those instincts are often very powerful and they can trump uh, behaviors that are conditioned as a result of the environment. Okay, all right, so um, the last videos um, in this playlist are going to focus on what's called the cognitive revolution, which is basically the period in psychology that followed the end of behaviorism. So there was a resurgence in interest in studying the mind. Um, and so really what precipitated the cognitive revolution, aside from this systematic rejection of behaviorism, was the advent of the computer, right? Um, so as soon as computers started to appear in the 1940s and the 1950s, they changed the way that psychologists thought about the mind, right? So in one sense, the psychologists believed that they could use computers as a metaphor for the mind, right? Um, and this makes sense um, because computers, the way that they're conceptualized, right, is there's um, typically some kind of input, right? So you input some kind of um, information into the computer um, and that information is converted into some kind of symbols like binary code, right? Um, and then that uh, symbolic information is stored onto a hard drive and then later retrieved, right? So um, if this sounds very familiar to you, um, this sort of um, information processing approach is how we uh, thought about memory for many, many years, right? So significance of cognitive revolution is that psychologists started to use the computer as a metaphor for the mind, right? And they also developed the field of artificial intelligence, which attempts to create computer programs that think like humans do, right? But what you'll find as you watch these next few videos is that it proved to be very, very difficult to create a computer program that adequately parallels human cognition. So it turns out that the human mind um, is, is, is much more powerful or much more capable uh, than even the most sophisticated computer programs. All right. Okay, so enjoy the next few videos on the cognitive revolution and artificial intelligence, and I'll see you guys in my next video.